Hello, everybody. It's Dr. B again. Uh, this is the third lecture video for Module 7. And in this one, we're going to talk about rotational motion. So using the same methods, same laws of motion, same forces, just going to get into uh, how to handle things when they're going in a curved path. So we have a good textbook, uh, but I really don't like the way it handles chapter six. Uh, so be careful with it. The, the main thing is, and they make this really unclear, but I like to, to make this clear is that centripetal is a direction. Okay, there's lots of different ways to say direction. There's left, right, up, down, centripetal. Okay, so centripetal means in towards the center. Okay, and just like I wouldn't call a force on a, on a free body diagram, I wouldn't say, oh, this is the left force, F sub left or F sub up. No, I would, I would say what the actual force is, force of the hand, for normal force, tension, whatever. Same thing for centripetal force. So that's where I differ from how the book handles things. They make things pretty muddy. So I encourage you to follow along with what's in this video as well as the videos uh, for the rest of the student note packet. All right, so let's think about some non-rotational motion. If you're in a car, you're going along, you slam on the brakes, during the braking period, it feels like you're getting pushed forward, okay? feel like you get pushed forward in your seat. Um, but if you think about it, the net force acting on you is, hmm, well, what, what do you feel pushing on you that wasn't pushing on you before? Your seatbelt. Your seatbelt is pushing backwards on you, okay? So if the net force is backwards, then that must mean your acceleration is backwards. And in fact, there's another way to figure out the direction of acceleration. You're moving forwards and slowing down, so you have to have an acceleration backward. Velocity forward, acceleration backward means you're slowing down. Okay, so we're definitely slowing down. Sorry about the, the demo with the fishing bobber. I didn't mean to leave that in. It's part of my usual thing when I'm in person and I missed that before I started this video. All right, uh, so does our sensation agree? No. We feel like we're getting pushed forward. We're actually getting pushed backward. All right. You're in a car and you start quickly from a stoplight. Feels like you get pushed back in your seat. But what actually happens? The seat pushes you forward. So there's a net force forward. Okay, the back of the seat pushes you forward. Your acceleration is forward. You have velocity forward, acceleration forward. And so you feel like you get pushed back, actually getting pushed forward. So again, your sensation disagrees with the actual direction of the force. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're 0 for 2 so far. All right, now let's get into some uh, rotational motion. Now, video 7.09 goes into this in more detail. So I'm not going to go all the way through this. But what you find out is that there are not forces acting in the centrifugal direction, okay, or centrifugal, okay, which is out from the center for any of these objects, okay? At least nothing consistently acting in that direction. But for every single one, there is a force acting in the centripetal direction or in towards the center, okay? And again, the force that we're going to list there, we're not going to list centripetal force. We're going to list what the actual force is, whether it's tension, force of gravity, normal force or something like that, we're listing the actual force, okay? That's acting in a centripetal direction, all right? So centripetal is a direction, not a type of force, okay? And then there's miscellaneous forces that sometimes will act in the centripetal, sometimes in the centrifugal, but just for a moment as it goes around. Again, see, see video 7.09 for more detail. I don't wanna repeat that, but what we find out is that objects travel in a circular path because of a force acting in, acting in the centripetal direction in towards the center. That's what makes things go in a circle. That's the important part of that. And it's up to us to find what force is it, and then we can figure out how big it is if we analyze the whole situation. All right, back to rotational, or back to this idea of these cases. You're in a car and you're driving at constant speed of 70 miles per hour, along a curved exit ramp, that's probably too fast. Uh, most exit ramps, you, you have to slow down a little beyond, below that. Um, but while you're going along the ramp, it feels like you're getting pushed 
outward. Okay, if you're thinking about the curve, it feels like you're getting pushed outward, but you're actually getting pushed inward. Okay, in towards the center of the circle. And your acceleration is also in towards the center of the circle. And so for the third time, we feel like we're getting pushed in a certain direction, but we're actually getting pushed in the other direction. And so we're 0 for 3. We're really bad at sensing which way the force is acting on us when we're in a car, for example. All right. Here's a diagram of that from the textbook, figure 6.15. And this is for a person going around a right hand turn. Okay. Or going on a clockwise ramp. Their actual force acting on them and their car is to the right, but it feels like getting pushed to the left. All right, some conclusions from this. I already talked about that one. And really already talked about that one. This is just summing it up. We feel it the opposite way of what it actually is. And to get something to move in a circle, you have to have a force acting towards the center. And then, as I mentioned, centripetal force, it's not some new kind of force. It's just figuring out what is the net force acting in the radial direction, meaning in towards the center. And so we've been talking about forces and Newton's laws. And Newton's second law is our equation, F equals MA. And here it is for, the, uh, for something working or moving in a curved path. So we could say F sub C. So that's centripetal force. But when I say F sub C, I mean the net force in the radial direction. I'm not talking about some specific kind of force. And then I won't use this again. I will write it just this way. I'll write summation of forces in the R direction equals MAC. Okay, and remember radial, we're using that to mean in towards the center and C for centripetal, meaning in towards the center. So even though it's not the same letter, an R here versus a C there, I'm still saying that that matches because they're both meaning the same thing. And if I were writing a textbook, I would have them match, okay? I know this one matches, but that one's a little bit different. That's, that's F sub C is the summation of all the forces in our direction. All right, if you have any questions about that, please ask. This is a, a really important uh, point here to understand this. Um, and again, these match just like when we have an X here, we have an X here, when we have a Y here, we have a Y here. When we have in towards the center here, with in towards the center there. Just this one's represented by an R, this one a C. All right. So let's think about your experience. And this is a case where your intuition is hopefully on, on par with the reality. Um, when going around a curve in a car, what two things could you do to cause the biggest force on you and your passengers? In other words, what could you do to make your passengers fear for their lives? Um, well, you could go faster or you could go around a tighter turn, okay? So both of those things impact the magnitude of the acceleration. And we have an equation on our equation sheet. I encourage you to find it right now. Pause the video, find this equation on your equation sheet, which is A sub C equals V squared over R, okay? And the T just means tangential, but don't fret over that. Just just take it as V squared over R, okay? How fast the thing is going, direction doesn't matter. You put a negative sign in there, it won't hurt anything as, you, as long as you use parentheses correctly in your calculator, or you could just skip it and then the parentheses are not as important or not important at all for this particular equation. Um, but as I said, if you want people to feel like uh, some, some fright as you're doing this, go faster. So that makes the top of this bigger or go around a tighter turn, which has a smaller radius of curvature, which makes the whole thing bigger. Okay, so either way, smaller turn, smaller, tighter turn, meaning smaller radius of curvature or faster, which is a bigger V sub T. Okay, so that's, that makes sense. That's in line with our expectations and our experience. All right. Choice of coordinate system, super important. We've been talking about that since module one, two, I don't know, um, for a long time, but we're gonna continue to pick a coordinate system. It's a little bit harder now, okay? 
So when we do this, when we have something that's moving in a curved path, we want to make sure we pick an R direction. We're going to do that first. Okay. So once we identify something's moving in a curved path, pick the R direction, which is towards the center of the circle. Okay. And then think about what direction is the T direction. And that's just the direction the object is moving. The T direction is just the object. The, the direction the object is moving. And then the y direction is the vertical direction, but only if we haven't already called up something else. So you have to be careful with that one. Basically, you're going to have a y direction if whatever you're analyzing is staying at the same height the whole time. So a car driving around a parking lot or a racetrack. Okay or a ball swung like this and it's staying at the same height the whole time. Anything where the thing stays the same height the whole time, you will have a Y direction. If it's going like this, or if it's a roller coaster, anything like that, you're not gonna have a Y direction because the, the thing is changing its vertical height and that's, that's your clue that that one's not gonna be coming into play. All right, the R direction, that's the most important one. If you can figure out that one, you're you're gonna be uh, doing pretty well. All right, so as an example, we're thinking about somebody on a roller coaster, they're coming down, the roller coaster car comes down here and then they get to this part, okay? Like three o'clock on a clock face. The T direction, that would be straight up, that's the direction they're headed at that moment, and the R direction is to the left. They keep going, they get up to here about uh, one or two o'clock. The T direction is right there, and the R direction down here. Remember, there's not a Y direction because this thing is not staying at a constant height. It's changing height as it goes. Keep going. We see the T direction is now pointed to the left, R straight down. And well, we could keep going, but those were the only three examples I, I built in. By the time you get to here, the T direction straight down, R direction here. When you get to here, R direction to the right. I'm sorry, T direction to the right, R direction straight up. All right, here is an example, and this is for a ball on a string. So if I were, if, if you imagine this black line to be the string, and we're holding it here, and the ball we're moving into the screen or into the page and going around and then coming back out, out of the page or out of the screen and going around. So it's staying at a constant height, okay? And if we do that, if we know this angle here, theta, this is the angle from vertical. And then we draw a free body diagram. Well, this is the free body diagram. The tension is parallel to the string. Weight acts straight down towards the center of the earth. All right, so how are we gonna analyze this? Well, draw a free body diagram. Good, done. Uh, define coordinate system. So we're gonna pick R to be in towards the center of the circle. If you had a hard time envisioning it, I apologize. I don't have a good demo for that right here. Um, but it is staying at a constant height. And so that means the R direction is right here. This is gonna be the center of the ball. And so maybe now you can more easily envision that uh, ball going around in a circle. If I were to do it with my finger, it would look like this. If my fingertip were the ball, it would be like that. And so the center of the circle is here, my other fingertip. Okay, the T direction would be into the page or into the screen. And then the Y direction, since it's staying at a consistent height, the Y direction is straight up. All right, so now we're gonna find the R and Y direction, Y, R and Y components of the tension because the tension is partly in the R direction, partly in the Y direction. The weight is entirely in the negative Y direction. So we don't need to do any trigonometry on that. We're gonna sum the forces in the R and Y direction using Newton's second law. All right, summation of forces in the Y direction equals MAY, T times the cosine of theta. Okay, so if we were to draw, say, can I draw on this? We've got T sub R here, and we've got T sub Y here. 
Okay. So this side over here, this is T cosine theta. That's positive. And then we've got MG, all of it straight down. If we solve for T, we see that T is equal to MG divided by cosine of theta. Uh, one interesting thing here is that um, the tension is doing more than supporting the weight of the ball. It is, it is supporting the weight of the ball. TY all by itself is supporting the weight of the ball. And then we also have TR. So that means T has to be bigger than the weight. Uh, cosine of theta, no matter what theta is, cosine of theta is always less than one. And so therefore, uh, mg divided by a number less than one, it's going to give you a number greater than mg. So that's just an interesting aside there, that tension has to be bigger than the weight. Um, and the further, the faster you spin it, the greater this angle will be, and the greater the tension becomes. Now in the r direction, t sine theta, that's this side here, that's in the positive r direction, and that's it. That's the only force acting in the r direction in this problem. And then that's equal to ma r or mac, okay? So again, r and c, we're using them both to mean in towards the center. And a sub c is equal to v squared over r. We get this, or we could, we could write it this way. We could put it more properly like this. Although I may have just gotten in the way of whatever comes next. Nope, that was it. All right. so. This is just some analysis without any numbers, but just to get you used to doing the steps. Okay, and again, it's those same steps as before. We have a new relationship for the centripetal acceleration, uh, but we're still using trig to do components, still draw a free body diagram, still pick an coordinate system. All right, so again, this is the third video in module seven, and each time I'm reminding you that we're going to, to use these same steps, decide your coordinate system, decide on what it is you're analyzing, draw your free body diagram, pick coordinate system, apply the second law in the oh, X and Y directions. I didn't catch that before, sorry. This is a little different. So the R and maybe the Y direction. You don't always analyze the Y direction. We'll see a lot of problems where we don't have to even analyze the Y direction. Some we do, some we don't. You'll see that as you do the note packet and the expert TA. Um, we won't ever sum forces in the T direction. It is possible and it's it's good to, you know, it's useful to do, but we won't do it in this course. All right, um, what's extra? Thinking about which way is the best way to look at it. Should you look at it from a top view or a rear view? Um, and just getting used to picking an R direction can be a little bit tricky. Okay, and this is my like step-by-step -step more detail in terms of what direction to uh, label it, uh, what direction to do the steps. And, you know, again, looking at your book is tricky and you gotta be careful. I think they do a bad job personally. Um, so don't label any of your forces as F sub C. They should be actual forces that you knew about before, like normal force, tension, friction, applied force. All right, do the R direction first, then T. Um, and if it's staying at the same height, then we'll have a Y direction. Sum the forces in each direction, well, as necessary. You may not have to do all of them. You definitely won't have to do some forces in the T direction. And then we have A sub C, which is equal to V squared over R. All right, or anything else? Oh yes, we have an example. Okay, now you should be able to see my desktop here, and we're gonna do this problem. And we have a woman here in the carnival ride, and this is like the uh, Gravitron at Rehoboth Beach, or what's the one? Riddle me this at Six Flags. <coughs> so it spins around, it's like a cylinder, and it spins around. So, we're gonna analyze it when she's here, not when, not where she is in the picture, but when she's all the way over at the right. So just a little bit earlier than what's shown in this diagram. And so when she's there, uh, let's see, the floor is pushing up on her. So there's a normal force. There's some static friction between her and the wall. There's weight. And let's see, oh, this is the normal force of the floor. And then what's pushing on her to the right? 
Well, the wall is pushing that way, and that's a called a that's a normal force. Okay, so because she's up against the wall, the wall is pushing on her. Normal force is always perpendicular to the motion, and so then we can draw in our axes, dashed line, or you can draw it off to the side. I like drawing mine with dashed lines. And the T direction, I'm looking at this from the front. So she's going over me. So the T direction will be into the page, that direction. And then this, since she's staying at the same height the whole time, up is just going to be the positive Y direction. So we're supposed to, I need to look at what we're supposed to find, but you're always going to draw a free body diagram. You're always going to pick a coordinate system. Since she was moving in a curved path, I picked an R direction. And I know T is into the page. Okay, I'll just make a note of that. Plus T is into the page. All right, or into the screen from where you are. Very good. So we're supposed to uh, figure out the speed of the woman. All right, let's do that. What can we do? What equations do we have? Well, we know A sub C equals V squared over R. And we know summation of forces in the R direction equals M A sub C. All right, so we got to use one or the other of those. Let's see. Hmm. Well, we know the diameter of the ride is 10 meters. So actually, we can just use this. We don't even need to sum any forces. So it turns out I did that work. 10 meters per second squared equals V squared over 10 meters. So we multiply both sides by 10 and take the square root. So V equals the square root of 10.2 times 10. Put the units in there. We get meters squared per second squared. I come out right around 10 because it's 10 times 10. And then we take the square root, but it's actually 10.2. So a little bit bigger than 10, 10.1. So V equals 10.1 meters per second. All right. So we didn't have to draw a free body diagram, but I wanted to anyway, or I would have wanted to even if I had known ahead of time that I didn't need it because I wanted you to see this. So you can see what it looks like when the ride is like this. And then I've never been on one that tips this far, but the riddle me this does tilt, um, tilts its axis over. So let's, let's go ahead and think about what's going on here when she's at the highest point up there. That's part B. So part B, What's going on? Well, her weight is downward. Okay, so we're thinking about her up there. The wall is pushing down. That's a normal force. And hmm, that's it. There might be, I don't know, might be some static friction coming out of the paper or into the paper, but there's not any other forces acting on her in that direction. Okay, so at that moment, Normal force and weight are acting downward. And downward is gonna be which direction? That's the plus R direction, okay? So up can't be the plus R direction for this. You have to pick down because that's, that's where the center is. Here's where she is for part B and the center's here. So R straight down. All right, we sum the forces in the R direction and we get W, which is positive, plus, plus Fn, also positive, they're both in the positive R direction, equals M times AC. And we already know A sub C is 10.2 meters per second squared, and we're supposed to find the normal force. So normal force equals 70 kilograms times 10.2 meters per second squared minus 70 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. Maybe I did too much at once there. Let me let me do a bridge here. M A C minus W. Okay, so normal force equals mass times centripetal acceleration minus her weight, where her weight is 70 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So the normal force 70 times 10.2 minus 70 times 9.8, 28 newtons. 
Uh, her weight, on the other hand, is 70 times 9.8, is 686 newtons. So the normal force acting on her is very, very small, which if you were the person in this ride and you, you weighed about 700 newtons, but the force acting on you, pushing the wall pushing on you was only about 30 newtons, you would be very scared because you'd be this close to falling. Um, so it's just barely going fast enough. All right, when she's at the bottom of the ride, so this is part C, when she's down here, the normal force from the wall is pushing up on her, her weight's acting down, and which way is the R direction? Upward. So dashed line to represent the coordinate system, the coordinate direction, not a solid line, that gets confusing. All right, sum the forces in the R direction. We get Fn minus W equals MAC. Normal force this time is MAC plus the weight. Before it was minus the weight, now it's plus the weight. So normal force equals, let's see, 70 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared plus 70 kilograms times nine, um, hold on. Sorry, this is 10.2. Sorry, I was thinking about my next things. So. A sub C is 10.2, G 9.8. And then if I just go back to my calculator, I've already got that in there. I just need to change the minus sign to a plus sign. And the normal force is 1,400 Newtons. So when she's at the bottom of the, the circle, okay, it's spinning around like this. When she's down here at the bottom, she's gonna feel a very large force, about twice what her weight is. When she's there, at the top, barely going to feel anything except feeling like she's about to fall. All right. So that gives you an idea of how to analyze um, one more problem. And let's see. Hold on for a second. All right. And now back to our PowerPoint. Just a reminder, we've been over these a lot of times, but I just like to hit these as many times as possible. Um, things moving in curves paths. If something's moving in a curved path, it doesn't matter if it's speeding up or slowing down it does have acceleration. It is accelerating because its velocity is definitely changing. You can't be going in a curved path at constant velocity. You cannot be going in a curved path at constant velocity because velocity is speed and direction, and you cannot have a constant direction if you're going in a curved path. All right, so definitely accelerating. We know how big the acceleration is. It's V squared over R. And centripetal is a direction, not a new kind of force. I know I've already said this like six times this video. Uh, and the plus R direction needs to be directed towards the center of the object circular path. Might be left, down, up, but you just gotta you just gotta figure it out and put it that direction. All right. That is all about circular motion. And I'm just gonna end. Uh, this is something I found from chapter four that I thought was really cool. If you are stuck, if you have your car stuck somewhere and you don't have a winch or a pulley, uh, but, you, but you have a rope or a chain, you could try to just attach the rope or chain to the car and just get some people and pull it. Okay, just pull straight along the dashed line and you may be able to get the car out. Um, but you could also attach it to the tree trunk, a tree trunk, and then, pardon me, if you push sideways on it, you are going to jet, excuse me, you're going to generate a very large tension in the chain or rope. And so by applying a small force here, you get a large force there. And that, that has to be to be able to get that to balance out. So that's a really interesting way to get yourself unstuck. All right, well, that is, oh, and, and why, why is that? All right, let me let me just briefly explain why that is. The um, they're showing the tension here pulling on the car, but as far as analyzing this spot right here, the tension going this way, and the tension going this way, and so each of these has a very small component this way, and the two components here and here add up to this one, which is going the other way, 
And so that's why that is, because you have to get a really large tension along the chain to get enough tension here to counteract even a small force perpendicular to the chain. All right, so that's just a useful bit, not related to rotational motion, but just I thought it was a good way to wrap up uh, our units on forces and Newton's laws. All right, be sure to stop by office hours or arrange the time to meet with me if you have any questions at all.